You know, here at A Rude Awakening, we have some pretty cool stuff. If you've ever come here for a visit, especially if no one else is around and I'm showing you around, I'm gonna show you this glass case that we have. And there's some artifacts in there from different parts of the world uh, that relate to the stories of the Bible. And one of the newest things we have in there is a piece of rock from Mount Sinai. And Michael Rude's in the studio today. I won't tell him this, but sometimes I lift up the glass and I let people hold the rock. So, <laughs> and people just get a real thrill out of holding a piece of Mount Sinai in their hand. And then of course we put the glass case over top again. But anyway, there's some really neat stuff here. And there's something I hadn't heard before, uh, but I did hear it from Joel Richardson. Last time he was here was about this, this, uh, this depiction of archers in front of Mount Sinai on a rock. What was that all about? And so we decided, well, the only way to really give this some credence is to have Joel Richardson back. So Joel, welcome back to Shabbat Night Live. And last time you were here, yeah, so you described these, these artifacts that I'd never heard of before. I don't know if anybody else picked up on them, but I wonder if you could tell the story of what they are, what they're all about, and, uh, and what it tells us about this, what happened at Mount Sinai. So this is interesting. Um, yeah, and when I was here, I, I believe that I shared the pictures of the archers, um, but there's actually another painting that I didn't talk about um, and I, I've kind of sat on it for the past few years, and I recently um, shared some pictures of that um, on uh, my YouTube channel, but we'll talk about that. So the first time that I went to Mount Sinai, um, there was six of us total, and we, we were walking up to the mountain. We were approaching the mountain. We got separated you know, a couple hundred yards because it was hours of walking. And just as I got to the base of the mountain, I came up to what looked like, I'll say it's almost like a cave-like structure, but it's not really a cave. The rocks, the formations there have some almost cave-like uh, elements. You know, maybe two people could sleep in this and get cover from the weather. But I saw this painting, you know, and it looked like what I would imagine, a caveman painting, you know, just very primitive. And I looked at it, you know, just got out my phone, started taking pictures. Well, it's a, it's a mural of probably about a dozen archers. Um, you can share the, the pictures here with the audience. And so I immediately, I took the pictures and I texted um, Penny Caldwell, a friend of the program, and I said, hey, check this out, what I just found. And I assumed others had found it before, but it's such a huge area. There's so many things around this rock or here, around this turn. And, um, and Penny goes, where is that? I've never seen that. And I thought, well, if Penny's never seen it, you know, Jim and Penny Caldwell, like they have been studying this mountain for decades. And I said, yeah, you know, and so she goes, that's amazing. Well, then I texted my wife and uh, my wife, Amy, she goes, that's exactly like in the book of Exodus. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? She goes, look at the end of Exodus 19, right off the top of her head. And, um, and I was like, yeah, Bible teacher. Come yeah, on. I was like, <laughs> what are you talking about, woman? I'm the Bible teacher here. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I do not suffer a woman. Uh, remain silent in the church. No. So anyway, she tells me, look at the end of Exodus 19. And I look it up and I'm like, you're kidding me. And so the Lord says to Moses, he says, go and consecrate the people. Tell them on the third day I'm coming down on the mountain. But tell them neither man nor beast should approach even the foot of the mountain. He says, if they touch the mountain, they are to be killed, either stoned to death or shot through with arrows is the implication. So I'm like, here it is, shot with arrows, if they approach the mountain, right at the base of the mountain, literally at the base of the mountain, is this painting of archers. And I went, yep, that's exactly what the Bible says. So it's kind of the modern equivalent of these cute little signs that say, this property protected by Smith & Wesson. Right. Um, at least most Americans will be familiar with that. And this was sort of the ancient version of that. And it may even have been possible that there were archers positioned there. That's possible. And I looked and I thought, you know, it's actually not unreasonable to think there's a possibility that Moses himself could have painted this. You know, I mean, it's, it's absolutely possible. Now, these particular paintings, the reason that they're preserved thousands of years is because they're on the underside of the rock. If they're on the top of the rock, the paintings get worn off. So I imagine there was a lot, because you do see a lot of these paintings. Most of what you see around Mount Sinai are the petroglyphs. They're different. They're actually carved or chipped into the rock, beating through this sort of dark, uh, what's called desert varnish. It's this dark microbial 
um, darkening that happens. They chip through it and they make these very primitive drawings. So those last forever, even in the weather. But if, mm. you get, if you get some of the paintings that are on the underside of the rocks, they'll stay. So the thing that I didn't share at the time was about oh, 20 yards from the archers, there was a friend of mine's son found another mural. And we took pictures of it, and I just didn't really know what to make of it at the time, and so I've sat on it, but the more that I've thought about it, looked at it, and studied the scriptures, the more that I said, no, I think this is also a profound biblical story that's being told here. And so again, we'll put the pictures up for everyone to see. And let me just say this, they're, you know, again, they're, they're primitive, they're pretty simple. Um, I also will give you some versions of the pictures that have been filtered through this app. It's actually a neat app that's used for rock climbers so that they don't touch if they come upon a petroglyph. It's a filter that helps you to see things that the human eye can't necessarily see. So it really helps you to see this image quite well. But essentially what you have is you have this whole cluster of people down below. There's maybe a dozen, 14 or so of them, these people. And then up above them are, there's several giants. I mean, they're, you know, four times, three or four times bigger than the smaller people. And you can see some of the little people that are up there with them. And it appears to be a battle. There's even in the middle of it, you kind of see a little bow and arrow. So it seems to be a battle between giants and normal sized people. So you go, well, what does that have to do with the Bible? Well, again, when you read the story of the Exodus, when Israel came to Rephidim, that's where the split rock was, it was there at Rephidim that they, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites and there was a battle at Rephidim. So you go, okay, so Israel fought all kinds of people. What does that have to do with giants? Well, when you actually study the scriptures in Exodus, I'm sorry, in Numbers 13, as they were going to spy out the land, Caleb and his crew, they, they came back and they said, we have seen the people in the land, we saw the Nephilim, we saw the children of Anak, um, and there are the Amalekites and the Jebusites, and he lists the different people, and he says they are very tall, exceedingly tall people. They are the, the Nephilim, they are the giants. So the point is this, and you can kind of tease it out by going through some of the, um, the, the familial lineage of the Amalekites, they're sort of descendants of some peoples from the kingdom of Edom and so forth. But the point is, the Amalekites had Nephilim blood. Michael, Dr. Michael Heiser has done some great work um, explaining all, so many of the peoples in the land were, were descendants of the Nephilim. And the Israelites, um, of course, defeated them. And you gotta love Caleb's spirit. He's like, they're grasshopper. Like, he's like, give me a break. Like, you guys are living in fear. We're gonna go in and we're gonna take them. I don't care if they're giants. The land is ours, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it was like, but they're too big. Caleb's like, forget about it. Let's go do this thing. So the point is the Amalekites were giants. And then here we have this picture. And again, it's not conclusive. I wanna be clear. But it is very suggestive because it's hard. You can find, for example, in the um, museum there in Jerusalem, you can find massive arrow metal spearheads that are like this big. You go, no normal sized person could. And then you'll get someone to say, well, that was probably just created as like a, an award to some hero. It wasn't used in battle. He just hung it on his wall. Like they, they make different, you have evidence of giants, okay? But you don't have a lot of paintings from this era. You don't have a lot of artistic depictions, right? Because we're dealing with a few thousand years, 3,000 years ago. But here you have an example of a painting at the base of Mount Sinai, which is obviously connected to the Exodus narrative, which seems to, again, portray a battle between smaller people and giants. And then further, if you look at them, the giants all have, they all have sort of this big square, rectangular, um, breastplate or something, which seems to be a shield, hmm. you know, which again would indicate that this is a battle because there's a few of them, when you look at it, that are, don't have this big square in front of them. They're giants, they're big tall people, but they're stick figures. But the ones that are actually in battle seem to have these, these uh, shields in front of them. So, you know, again, the skeptics will probably disregard it, but I think it's a, it's a pretty powerful faith-boosting uh, neat little discovery 
that my uh, my friend's son found. So, um, yeah, I, I shared it shared it with the body, and I think a lot of people have been encouraged. And you know, you think about it. So. Sometimes we assume in the West, oh, everything that needs to be found has been found. But we have to think about, if there were truly millions of Israelites out there and they were all making their their mark on rocks to sort of record what was happening here, who knows how much is still out there by how how many artists were depicting this of, of the Israelites. Yeah, there's so much yet undiscovered. Again, this is Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. Um, on my most recent tour, I actually went with renowned Israeli biblical archaeologist Eli Shukran. So this is the first, he's the first real legitimate credentialed biblical archaeologist that, that went. And I've been very careful because I don't want to speak on his behalf. Um, and I really just let him look at everything. I didn't try to impose my particular views. And um, he was, um, as an archaeologist, I mean, he was drooling. You know, he's like, oh, I would love to excavate this. I would love to excavate this. And one of the things that I don't know if I mentioned this, but being who I am, going to Saudi Arabia, I've had, over the past four years, I have had so many, and I hate to say this, random grave robbers reach out to me and say, hey, I have this, I have that. Would you like to buy it? And sometimes I'll ask, "What do you? how much do you want? Just curiously, obviously, I wouldn't touch this stuff with a 10-foot pole because it's stolen. Like the, these are folks, these are <laughs> amateur archeologists. They know where the stuff is. They go digging with, and, and, um, and some of the stuff clearly, clearly Jewish artifacts with menorahs, with, now some of it might be from the Bar Kokhba era, you know, the first century, some of it's much older. Some of the stuff is stunning. Um, the pictures, I can't share it again because you don't know if it's a forgery. And again, it's illegal. I would love for the Saudi government to find these folks and go after them and get, recover these artifacts. But there's no question that in the years ahead, when the Saudi government allows legitimate archaeological digs, the things that will be discovered around Jebel al laws are incredible. If, if a dummy like me, you know, just walking up with my iPhone can make a discovery like that, uh, I have no question that once we start approaching this more scientifically, it's going to be, I genuinely believe Jebel al laws will, in, in years ahead, it will come to be viewed as the single greatest biblical archeological find in history. I mean, this is Mount Sinai. This is the foundation. This is the golden chalice. All of the archeologists, they wanna be, you know, besides finding the Ark of the Covenant, like Mount Sinai is it. And for what it's worth, what's interesting is in the, the whole world of biblical archaeology, and again, most of these guys are, I mean, a lot of them are not even believers, right? But what they'll say is they'll say, we have clear evidence that the Bible is at least historically true back until the time of David. Hmm. They'll say, but really, we don't have anything before that. Now, of course, just recently up there at um, Mount Gerizim, they found this little, small little piece of lead and on the lead, it had some of the curses of the covenant. Of the curse the tablet. Yeah, the curse tablet. Mm -hmm. Still a little bit controversial, but it's pretty clear. It's got, it's got Yehovah's name, some of the curses on it and so forth, that this is now saying, okay, well, now we have that evidence back to the time of Joshua. That just knocked it back a few hundred years from David. Pretty fascinating. But the one era that all of them will say we have no clear evidence of is the Exodus. Hmm. is Mount Sinai. Now, of course, it's because they've been looking in the wrong place. They've been looking in all the wrong places. Now that Saudi Arabia is open, by the grace of God, the Saudi royal family will be smart enough to preserve and protect this. I believe they will do that. Unfortunately, they are building a highway um, right through that area, which is... I was gonna ask you about that. So what is the? what do you see as the future of, or the, the peril of Mount Sinai with the city of Neom clearly being built right now, and you say a highway is going right near there, do you think they'll, they'll protect this as a national park or something, or? I believe so, um, I believe so. Unfortunately, so they're putting in, there, there will be pavement now in between the golden calf altar and the mountain itself. And that road may even be paved right now. Last time I was there, massive construction equipment. There's whole little cities of workers and so forth, and they're building this other, ski resort nearby. Um, I think I'm pronouncing it right, Trojena. 
and it's they're going to host the like Asian Winter Games there in a few years. So there's math. There, I mean, think about this in Saudi Arabia, they're building a ski resort, pretty close to Mount Sinai. So that's going to bring a lot of traffic. It's going to bring a lot of visitors, and because this used to be out in the middle of nowhere, now they're going to develop this. Now let me just say this: the city of Neom, the line. The line is this city that will be, it's it's this single building that's 200 plus kilometers long. It's really quite fascinating. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of different building. It's very far. Like, this is a huge area. It's quite far from the mountain. It's not like you're going to, you know, be on the mountain and just look and see all this, like, development. But my hope, and for everyone, like, what I've been trying to communicate to the Saudi royal family is that this is... Mount Sinai is the greatest source of revenue imaginable. They will be competing with Israel overnight for Christian tourists, Muslim tourists. This is something, believe it or not, Jews, Muslims, Christians, people you know, from all three of the faiths can go there. It, it's not contradictory to the Quran, that this is where Moses lived, that Jethro, they call him Shu'aib. This was the, the Valley of Tor is called in the Quran. This is, it's not contradictory to their story. So they can benefit people, again, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, and they can make good money doing it. So hopefully they preserve it and protect it, and it doesn't become a place where you got all these people selling trinkets at the base of the mountain, like when you go to Petra or something like that. That would be a tragedy if something so sacred was not truly preserved. We hope that they'll preserve it. This highway going through there is really a massive disappointment, um, but time will tell. At least they didn't build it through the golden calf altar. Yeah, exactly. Or something yeah. to that effect. Yeah. As uh, Keith Johnson noted when he went last time, uh, the fence around there because of a flood had actually been, it, part of it had collapsed. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, they're not even really out there that that often to keep keep track of what's going on out there, even yeah. weather-wise. Yeah, everyone's like, I thought the mountain's surrounded by a fence. How'd you get there? And I was like, well, the fence is tipped over. <laughs> <laughs> just walked over it, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. You know, and it, it's, it's like, I liken this to a city where, you know, if there were millions of Israelites, or however many were there were, you know, it's, it's like a city that's been abandoned. And then a few people go in and say, oh, I found this artifact, I found that artifact. But there were a million people there. There's going to be a ton of stuff to find and show to the world that this really does prove the Israelites and then prove Exodus and then prove the validity of the entire Bible. Yeah. And now that, that is going to be something that the world's going to have to reckon with. Yeah, The absolutely. Exodus did happen. Yeah, and, th and this is the thing. I, again, I'm convinced, you know, Jesus says the rocks will cry out. Like if you remain silent, the rocks <laughs> will cry out. The overwhelming statement throughout the Exodus, Passover, remember. Do not forget, do not forget. Remember, remember, remember. But really, the whole world's forgotten. I mean, yes, you know, the, the Jews celebrate Passover. It's the longest, most continuously celebrated holiday in human history. They preserve it, but again, even, you know, you think Reformed Jews, they don't really connect with the story. It's more of a cultural issue. But the Lord is about to remind the whole world, remember this, remember this. Because again, from a New Testament perspective, the return of Yeshua, all of the imagery of the return of Yeshua is the greater theophany. God came down on the mountain at Mount Sinai. That was intended, the God who wrote this book intended that event to be understood as a faint prophetic foreshadow, a dress rehearsal for the far greater theophany that is to come when he breaks forth from heaven in thick storm clouds, in blazing fire, with armies of angels, with the blasting of trumpets, with a mighty earthquake. All of those things were present at Mount Sinai. He descended on the mountain in fire, in consuming fire. He's coming back in blazing fire. And so because the Lord is preparing the world for the return of Yeshua, he's going to use this historical event. He's gonna remind the world in order, I, I'm convinced, to try to wake people up and prepare for what's coming. 